Welcome to the Climate Q&A. Um, my name is Louise and today me and Ben will be co-hosting this event. Hi, so my name is Ben. I am a first year university student and I'm studying economics and politics. I was lucky enough to uh, co-host this event last year and it was an amazing experience and I'm sure all the students here, if you weren't there last time, you'll really enjoy it. Um, a bit more about me. Since then, I've been working with other companies, working on different campaigns, particularly Marks and Spencer with their Look Behind the Label campaign, thinking about promoting sustainable conversations around the dinner table. And I'll pass over to Louise to introduce herself. Hi, my name is Louise. I'm currently in my first year of sixth form studying politics, French and history. I'm Deputy Chair of Brighton Hove Youth Council, through which I've been involved with a few climate projects, such as the Youth Climate Summit and reducing plastic pollution. Uh, as well as this, I am uh, the Youth Representative at CYPS committee meetings here in Brighton Hove. Um, you can follow Youth Council, Brighton Hove Youth Council, at BH Youth Council on Instagram. Uh, so, special welcome to our speakers, uh, MPs, uh, Caroline Lucas from the Green Party, Peter Kyle and Lloyd Russell Morgan from the Labour Party, as well as Councilman Samir Vegan from the Conservative Party. And I would like to hand over to Caroline Lucas to give a short introduction to herself and what she's done since the last event. And again, I'd like to say it now, um, if we could hold all this uh, speaking to a minute, uh, that'll be really helpful. But uh, we will keep you on time and give you a short warning. But um, yeah, handing over to Caroline Lucas to introduce herself. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, everybody. And trying to fit this into a minute is not really fair, but uh, I will try. I was at COP26. I took part in the launch of something called the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty. I hope it's something we can talk about more. It's basically a big um, initiative from the global south to keep fossil fuels in the ground. Um, I held an adjournment debate just this week in Parliament uh, to put all of that on record and to challenge ministers not to go ahead with more um, oil and sea licenses in the North Sea and certainly not to go ahead with a new coal mine in Cumbria, which they are planning to do. I have responded to many of the government's initiatives, including their energy security strategy, which is frankly a shocking document that does not do anything for home insulation, energy saving, that's the best way to get ourselves uh, off Russian gas and to get prices down is to invest in a uh, house to house proper home insulation scheme, it's not been done. I put amendments to the post 16 education and skills bill, which would have helped oil <clears throat> and gas workers to access jobs in renewable energy more easily. Uh, and for COP27, I want the government to show more domestic leadership as well as to delivering more financial resources for countries in the global south. Just on time, thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> um, and moving on to MP Peter Kyle, please keep it to a minute. Thanks so much, it's really good to be here. Thanks for inviting me back. It's good to see so many uh, faces from before and new ones. Uh, I too have been really busy you know, on this agenda, you know, locally, primarily as a, as a constituency MP, I've been out with the teams who are installing the uh, electric charging points because I care very much about the hydrification of our electric uh, of our transport system locally and electrification of our uh, transport system locally. Uh, it's really good that we've got 254 charging points now uh, across the city. Uh, I support passionately the way that we can just change people's uh, people's uh, method of, uh, of transport. Uh, we really need to get the park and ride sorted as well in the city so we can keep make sure we get cars out of the city centre as the, as the next stage as the People's Assembly uh, for the climate change uh, for climate emergency said. Um, but also I've been um, working very closely with the Rampian project so that we can get the next stage two off the ground, working on their consultation, working closely with the company uh, and having been out there to the wind farm to, uh, to see it for myself. Uh, and also to try and get government, and I've been campaigning with government to try and get the Great British Rail sale extended over school holidays so that young people can actually take advantage of it and families can travel with their, 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 their children over the school holidays. But unfortunately, government has refused so far to extend it so it can be more family friendly. So trying to change uh, nationwide policy and trying to do practical things locally so that we can make the changes that we need to take carbon out of our economy and society. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'd like to hand over to Samir to introduce himself. Thank you so much, Ben, and thank you, everyone. 
I think like my colleagues, I've, um, I attended COP, but I attended COP remotely only through invites and through former colleagues who were running multiple events around cities and the role of cities in, in, in fighting climate change, which is, which is something I'm very passionate about, as it is my area of work, in addition to what I do here in, in, in Brighton and Hove. Um, so we've done a lot of stuff locally, and I see colleagues mentioned a few. The push for EVs, I think, is a challenge for me, because although we have multiple electric vehicle charging points, half the time these do not work. And when they do work, there's not enough juice in the system. Charging a vehicle at 1.8 kilowatts per hour takes a long time to actually go through into a car. Um, I think like Peter been talking through Rampion, but pushing for something else, which is a private cable into the city so that we can actually beef up our own energy and, and electricity resilience, which I think we'll come on to later on. Uh, we've done a lot of stuff at the council. We're currently about to sent for approval a circular economy route map, which is the first one for the city, which is a brilliant cross-party um, achievement. On COP27, um, there's a couple of things I want to push. And one, as a, as a resident, uh, well, as a citizen of, of the Middle East, I think it's great that COP is coming to that part of the world, but we need to push for more women participation. Women made up only 7% of delegates at Glasgow. It's a worry for, the, for both Egypt and the UAE into a COP27 and 28, and we really need to make a big push on both fronts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and last but not least, Lloyd Russell Moyle. Hello, I'm Lloyd Russell Moyle covering Brighton at Kemptown. Um, uh, of course, I attended uh, COP uh, as well at my area. Um, the focus was around young people's participation. Um, and for many years, I coordinated the youth, uh, the, the youth sections at the UN. And so it was important for me to support some of the more radical demands of young people uh, and uh, push further for action um, uh, from governments. This wasn't, I'm afraid, I don't think, achieved, particularly around the demand for fossil fuels to remain uh, in the ground and will continue to have to push for that. I've had some very interesting discussions with car manufacturers over the last year, particularly Tesla, but including others as well, about how we actually move to making um, cars uh, that are um, electric affordable for people. Um, there's no point in them being so unaffordable no one can afford them. And going forwards, what we need, of course, in COP27 um, is a set of more binding, ambitious plans. Thank you so much. And hopefully the minute didn't feel too rushed. But again, for the rest of the questions, we'll be sticking uh, to a minute for the speaker time. And so I'd like to hand over to Basvik for the first question. And again, they have a minute as well if they would like to introduce or say what they've done in this past year and what they've been doing. So Basvik, if you'd like to answer your, uh, ask your question. Hi, so we're Basvik. We're from the Climate Change Society, which has over 100 students as part of it. Um, so I'm just going to quickly outline some of the things we've done this year to help the climate response. So, you, you're very quiet. I'm struggling to hear you. Sorry. Mm. <laughs> um, among many of the other things we've done, we've encouraged over 400 students this year to complete the carbon literacy qualification. Um, and that teaches students further about climate change, its impact, factors contributing to it and also what we can do to reduce our impact to lead a lower carbon lifestyle. Um, we put on many events like clothes swaps and a vegan year event where we sold Thai vegan curry and promote the idea that vegan food is good and not expensive. Um, Basvik has also created a roadmap to help the college become net zero by 2030. And we as students are helping this journey through our climate change society. And our question is, how can young people stay motivated to campaign for the environment? when it seems that lawmakers continually fail to respond to the scale of the problem. Thank you. And so could I ask Caroline to answer first, then Lloyd, then Peter, and then Samir, please. Uh, thanks, Ben, and, and thanks, uh, Basvik, and congratulations on what you're already doing. The Carbon Literacy Project is fantastic, and I'm so glad you're focusing on issues around diet and agriculture as well, because that so often gets left out of the carbon uh, discussions. I'm really disappointed that um, political leaders are not engaging with young people as much as they should. 
I tried to arrange for party leaders to meet climate uh, leaders before COP26, young climate leaders, and sadly it didn't happen, but I'll keep trying. I want to flag to you in case you're not aware of it, you probably are, the wonderful work being done by Green New Deal Rising. These are a group of, of primarily young people who are basically doorstepping politicians, whether that's Rishi Sunak or Keir Starmer, and asking them direct questions about their climate record and then putting that on social media. And it's getting lots of, lots of engagements, lots of interest. So I would say to you that you are the ones who are already showing so much climate leadership but it shouldn't have to be down to you to make the time to go on climate protests. It should be that government is acting and I'll do everything that I can to make sure that they do. And just please know that the public is absolutely on your side. Thank you so much, Caroline. And Lloyd, if you'd like to answer the question, please. Um, well, I think one thing you have to remember in a lot of political change is that often it comes as a tsunami. And your work, keep pushing politicians, even though it seems like the national leaders take no action or too little action, it will come eventually. And maybe it will come eventually because you become the politicians um, and take over from us and get rid of the ones that have not done enough. And I know that feels like uh, it, that takes too long, particularly with, um, with the impending crisis. But I think that, that, that you must, must steal yourselves about that. People like Teach the Future as well, um, uh, that, that was mentioned, very important, that we, um, that we make climate change education compulsory. And the government have got some very weak commitments to that, but we need to push further uh, for that as well so people have the right information. And it's not just about teaching um, uh, people in school and college. Actually, what I think we need to start a proper education process around older people, uh, adults, uh, because they are actually a number of the roadblocks. Thank you very much for your answer. And uh, Peter? Yeah, thanks. My advice is that this is the same challenge that every campaigner will always have, whether you're campaigning for social policy, environmental policy, or scientific policy. Uh, and focus on the cha on change. Politics is about progress. In fact, the word politics is, uh, is rooted in, in government progress. It's about a system of progress. It's not about revolution. So most of the changes that deliver the most profound change in society come in the form of progress. So the 2050, for example, the 2050 net zero target came from a backbench bill that was introduced by Rachel Reeves, which was supported by Caroline Lloyd and myself as co-signatories. And it was only when, we, when government realised that we had the numbers to win that they introduced the target on the same day. So we know that, that actually backbench power and the power of parliament and the power of you lobbying and supporting and encouraging, cajoling MPs does matter. But then look at the second example, and that's the target to have to end the combustion engines in cars. That er original target was came in when the government was forced to do it, but they, they set a target of 2040. And then last year, they brought the target forward to 2030. That's an example of getting the first hurdle uh, out of the way, getting the target set, then moving to the next stage, which is bringing the target forward. So progress is what's important. Sometimes you don't get everything you need the first time and you work on the next stages. And that's about being strategic. And I know it's hard when you know the consequences of what we're talking about and the urgency of what we're talking about. Sometimes you get it in one fell swoop. Sometimes you have to take steps in the right direction. But if you work with the right people at the right time, it can, progress can be made. So don't lose heart, is what I'm saying. Thank you very much. And finally, Samir. Thank you, thank you, Ben. And, and thank you guys for that, for that question. I, I do recognize some of you from our sustainability masterclass earlier in the week. So it's good to see you back here. Look, it's, um, I think you've heard me say this before on, 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 on Wednesday. What, what's critical, I think, um, and, and it's a message that you can push forward far more strongly, I think, than, than any of us can, particularly because you can do it through your teachers uh, um, and through other colleagues, because I think that's how this message will get around, which is that while we're working on climate change, while we're working on climate action, the scale of the problem isn't limited to one or two areas. Actually, it's massive. You know, it's, it's not only about the environment, it's about buildings, it's about transport, it's about food systems. As, as you guys have, have very much clearly understood, it's about land use and where we allocate land for agriculture, for buildings, and, and so on. And those layers 
And those interdependencies are critical into effective action. And I think the fact that you understand that that is the core of, of some of the action, I, I think it's it's brilliant. We do things at multiple levels. You know, the stuff that nations do, the stuff that cities do, the stuff that businesses do, the stuff that politicians do, and the stuff that 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 you can do. And you're very much part of that puzzle. You know, we and we at all of us, I think, are 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 with you because not only are you young people and and students, but you're also residents of of the cities and users of the built environment. There are a lot of people out there doing some really important work on skills. You mentioned the carbon literacy program, and I spoke with your teachers on Wednesday. But there are organizations like Class of Your Own who are really out there encouraging young people like you to get into, not politics, but actually into the built environment where you can have a massive impact. And you know, soon you'll be doing a GCSE in the built environment, which I think is absolutely important to capturing those interdependencies but also putting you on the right path, I think, for a career where you can honestly and seriously have an impact. Thank you. Thank you very much for all your answers. And so we're gonna move on to the second question from Downs View Link College, um, which I'll ask now, which is, with the rising cost of electricity disproportionately affecting children and young people with disabilities and special needs, who need to change house, charge hoists, hospital beds, communication devices, etc. What funding slash support do you or your party propose to help them deal with these rising costs? And we will take answers from Lloyd first, then Peter, then Samir, and then Caroline. Thank you. Can, can we just also have our student views as well? Yes, yes, That'd be lovely. go ahead. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I want Luca to say what Downstreet Link College have been doing. So big voice, Luca. Uh, you'll come to the screen. What should I say? So come up here. So Lucas. What are you doing? So, swap shop to receive items from home for others at college, like books and toys. Thank you, Luca. And Travis, do you want to come up? Uh, uh, I have brilliant. all of that I have to keep, don't I? Yeah, that's fine. But sometimes I don't, Travis, sometimes I don't need to, do I? Travis, do you want to come up here? So this is Travis, very quickly. Visits to local parks and woods. Brilliant, Travis, thank you. Ramon, do you want to read? Um, there's Ramon. <laughs> So Ramon says, litter picking on the college field. That's what we do. Brilliant, Ramon, do you want to go and sit down? Uh, and I Nelly. Get my oh, you're okay. You can, you can remember. Do you want to sit here? I'll help you. I'll help you. You can remember it is. This is Nelly. Do you want to sit down, Nelly? So it's recycling. Recycling. What do we recycle? Plastic, paper, and cardboard. So well done, everyone. Well done, guys. Thank you. So we'll take the first answer from Lloyd. Thank you. Well done. And it's good to see that you guys are doing things in your local area. But the cost of um, electricity and fuel is unacceptable. It doesn't have to be like this. Uh, the Labour Party put forward a plan that would tax um, the energy producers and reduce uh, bills. And it's quite easy because the cost of producing energy has not gone up. All that's happening is that there is a, a global market shortage and, uh, and the producers are making huge profits that they put in their pockets and they keep. They don't invest it in renewables like the Conservatives claim. They just don't do anything with it. What needs to happen is the government needs to take those profits. It needs to keep uh, energy bills fixed uh, at a lower rate. In France, they've only fixed them to 5%. And in the long run, we need to invest in proper um, uh, renewables. The government still refused to support onshore 
wind electricity generation, even though it's the cheapest form of electricity generation known to us at the moment, instead investing in expensive vanity projects. And we need to invest, as Caroline has talked about, around house to house home insulation. Those things would bring bills down. They would make them cheaper than they were. And in the long run, we need to aim to have every single house with solar panels on. And I think that's one of the great things that we pushed for here in uh, Brighton. Um, the Labour Party pushed to make sure that the solar panel programme was focused on the very poorest to ensure that those who need it can make sure they're starting to generate their own electricity. Those are the things we would like to do, but I'm afraid the government are not doing any of them. Uh, and next, uh, uh, Peter, please. Um, thank you so much for such lo lovely presentations there. They really, really made an impact. Uh, just to say very simply that the, the, the core problem that we have with your question is that people living with disabilities are not a qualifying group in the mainstream programmes of government, such as warm homes discount. Uh, so to your core question, you know, when it comes to the big flagship programmes of government that support people in need, very, very often, in fact, in the majority of cases, when you look at the big mainstream programmes, people with disabilities aren't a qualifying group. That is something that the Labour Party wants to change, and it's something that I want to change, so that when there is a specific need, that people living with disabilities can qualify uniquely rather than having to make their way into other groups, such as reaching an age threshold, in order to qualify. That is something that will unlock the additional support that it need, that you need, and sometimes your families will need, in order to get the support you need at all stages of life. Thank you. And now, Samir? Lovely. Thank you so much, and thank you for those um, lovely pieces of work that, that you've been doing. It's, it's so, so energizing, I think, to just see and hear what you've, what you've been up to. I think, look, colleagues talked about the global trends that are causing the rise in energy prices, and they are real. I mean, these, these I think, we're on, we're on the BBC this morning. Look, and I get the fact that, that big energy providers aren't doing their thing, but, and, and this is not in their defense. So, for example, this morning we had Scottish Power on the Hydrogen Sussex Group talking about the innovation and the investment Scottish Power is doing locally and supporting local businesses and residents to drive that kind of innovation which we need. Because I think the more innovation we have, it's likely that we're going to pay less for those energy prices. So there are things that are happening nationally. So we, we're doing onshore, we're doing offshore wind, which which I think. Is, is the way forward. You know, onshore wind has a lot of issues, particularly with, 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 with people kind of voting with their feet against it. We're building the biggest um, offshore wind farm, Dogger Bank, which will generate enough power, mm -hmm. power six million homes nationally. We're also, we're also needing to do things locally. And what we have locally is that the better insulated homes are not in the most deprived areas. In fact, the most deprived and, and people with disability in our city live in the least energy homes. I think that's where we need local targeted action. But again, that kind of work needs funding. That kind of work needs grants, but it also- Sorry, I'm going to have innovation. to cut you off here. That's um, all right. Uh, thank you. Caroline? Thank you. And thank you so much for the questions, which were really powerful. Um, I think that what this government is doing is frankly scandalous because they are actually cutting the warm homes discount. This was um, uh, some extra money to go to help people pay with their, their fuel bills. They're cutting that warm homes discount for people with disabilities because if families are on so-called PIP, personal independent payments or uh, DLA, they are no longer going to be automatically eligible for the warm homes discount. That's going to affect around 200,000 people with disabilities. That's just wrong. We've talked already about how there should be a tax on the windfall profits of the energy companies. They are raking in billions of pounds, which was not expected, and they should be putting that money back to the government. The government should be demanding that. They should be using that money both to make sure that people with disabilities do have enough money to be able to heat their homes, and also to do things like uplifting the universal credit. You'll know that that was cut. The uplift was cut from universal credit that needs to be restored, it needs to be doubled. Real finance needs to go to families who are struggling. This government is refusing to do it. 
Thank you. Thank you, and we'll move on to the third question, and this is going to be asked by Patcham High. And again, if they would like to give a short roundup of the action they've taken the past 12 months, uh, you have the minute to do so. So, Patrick, if you'd like to ask a question, please. Um, so, yeah, here at Patcham, we've been taking part in the COP26 big lesson and then proceeded to inform the entire school about that COP26 conference. Uh, we've also been encouraging the use of recycling in the school. And, yeah. yeah, we've also had quite a successful switch off the lights campaign. Um, and we're looking into solar power with the Brighton Energy Co-op, um, as well as starting an eco garden in the back of the school, which we're very proud of. So our question for you is, um, are you encouraging more safe cycling lanes away from traffic, which would encourage more people to cycle around Brighton Hove? Thank you for your question. And so if I could ask Peter to answer first and then Samir, Caroline and then Lloyd. Firstly, thanks for your update. When you mentioned the Brighton Energy Co-op, there was a cheer in my office from the background because we're very big supporters, uh, supporters of them. Um, so, yes, look, I, I want more cycling lanes. I want more the transition to cycling to be to be increased. And I want to do it in a way that takes communities with us. So all of the proposed in, in Hove and, and Portslade, the constituency I represent, all of the proposed cycle lanes, bar one, um, I have supported. Uh, the, the one that I didn't was one that caused a huge amount of controversy because one of the key communities that it intersected uh, was, was disproportionately impacted and not consulted. Uh, and actually what that does is it makes the issue of cycle lanes uh, controversial and it should never be controversial. This is something that a city like Brighton and Hove should be fully embracing. So we need to find those communities that, that, that are really open to this and focus on those and make sure that we prove that when, when we can do it, that it works so that it's a desirable thing that communities are asking for and neighborhoods are absolutely asking for. We do need to make this transition, but we all know that when it comes to all forms of transport, when it all comes to all forms of development and change of physical space in our constrained city, it is very, very challenging. So we have an additional need to get this right as a community. I myself put my money where my mouth is. I don't have a car. For the last 12 years, I've relied entirely on active transport. Uh, and the local uh, bus network and public transport. So it's something I care about, but as a politician, my job is to take communities with us. So we must put much, much more effort into showing, the showing that these, uh, the, the uh, cycle lanes and cycling per se works, that it is desirable uh, and finding ways to actually heal the divide that, that seems to erupt and bo on both sides of the debate, try and make sure that we, we can lead communities through this change in a positive way rather than actually turn communities against themselves over something actually that benefits the Sorry, neighbourhoods and the city. Thank you so much for your answer, Peter. And uh, Smith, if you'd like to ask, uh, answer. Lovely. Thank you, Ben. And, and, and thank you guys for the, for the question. I, I think like Peter, we kind of had this, this thing in Hove with the, with the old Shoreham cycle lane, which was very, very, very di divisive. But again, we've, we've supported all, all other measures locally as well. So with that, I think it's really critical that you not only consult, that you engage and you take people with you because that's how you get things done. We had a really clear demonstration of why that hasn't happened at the last full council where we had a 2000 petition against the cycle lanes on the old shore road and we had another 2000 signature petition for that. So, you know, it was very much split evenly. And you're seeing it now happening again in Turner with Livable Turner. You know, if you open your Brightonian magazine this week, you know, there's, a, there's an article for and an article against simply because we've not really engaged and had those conversations with, with the people that, that matter, the people on the ground who are deeply affected by this. Cities are doing some really great things locally, Glasgow, Bristol, even, even London is making headways. We really don't need to look far for best practice. We also need to really look closely for good practice in consultation and engagement. And I believe with that, we can really get more done rather than simply spend months bickering about what's right and what's wrong. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Caroline? Thanks so much. Well, I'm proud of the work that's been happening locally to encourage cycling and walking. and. Greens absolutely recognise the need for segregated cycling infrastructure. And clearly the main barrier to cycling in this country is the fact that our roads are too dangerous and uncomfortable, largely due to the high volumes and high speeds of, of motor traffic. 
Um, over 90% of roads in Brighton are dedicated to private car use. So I think we could do with a bit of, of balancing out and making sure that cycling is safe for everyone. When it comes to the controversies around some individual um, cycle lanes, I, I would say two things. First, I think it was deeply unfortunate that the government basically gave such a short amount of time for money that was going to be used for cycle lanes to be dispersed, which meant that the consultation period was more condensed than it would ideally have been. Uh, and that was because if, if that hadn't happened in that time scheme, we would have simply lost that money. But secondly, I also think it's sad to see some, some myths being repeated about cycle lanes. I'm proud of the leadership that the Green Group has shown on this issue. Um, and it's been disappointing, frankly, that they've been outvoted. And as a result, some cycle lanes have been removed. Um, and that's resulted in our city losing funding from the government for future schemes. So yes, we've got to take people with us, but we also need to be really honest with people and show some leadership on this as well. Thank you so much. And finally, Lloyd. No, well, I've been pushing very much. In fact, it was my intervention that managed to get the cycle lane, uh, the, the cycle route between uh, Woodingdean and Falmer, a key route for people who are going to, say, Backer or at the universities, to be resurfaced after it became uncyclable uh, and, and was a complete mess. Uh, neither East Sussex or Brighton and Hove, who share the route, said it was their priority and they were pointing their fingers at everyone and I got people around the table to get that completely resurfaced and rebuilt and is now used. Um, we are now pushing for a new cycle lane around uh, from Peace, from the edge of New Haven all the way through Peace Haven into Saltdean, connecting the city and not making cyclists have to use the A259, which is, I'm afraid, just a horrible road to use. It's horrible enough to walk along it, let, let alone cycle along it. And it is a national cycle route. It's an absolute disgrace. East Sussex County Council and the Highways Authority are dragging their heels on that, but we will get there eventually to make sure that is uh, implemented. And I have supported other cycle lanes too. I would like us to be more ambitious. I think there are some roads that could be pedestrianised, St James's Street, you know, St George's Road in my constituency. They could be pedestrian and cycle and then access only routes and it would make a real difference to the area. But I'm afraid people are too reluctant to it. And one of the reasons people are too reluctant to it is because um, the old Shoreham Road backfired and now people are at once bitten twice shy and we must make sure that doesn't happen. We must make sure we push forward with ambitious schemes, but we bring the communities along with them and we don't treat the schemes as a way to punish drivers. What we do is we have it for everyone. And finally, Sorry, I'll quickly to, say okay, quickly, is quickly, that quickly. also shared spaces between cyclists and pedestrians are not always the answer either. And that does cause danger as well. We need proper separate routes for cyclists so they are safe in all terms. Thank you so much for all your answers. Okay, question four uh, is from Paka and uh, please include a short update on what you've done over the last 12 months. Hello, can you hear us all right? Yes. You guys wanna go for it? All right. Over the last 12 months, our school has been mainly focused on stuff like recycling. So pretty much all our bins are recycling bins. And then um, after lunch and break, we um, have like litter pickers who like go around and like pick all the litter up from the fields. And our question is, how will you be encouraging or working on policy to reduce the amount of plastic packaging used on food particularly in relation to food in schools and colleges? Thank you for your question. Um, first, we'll have Samir, then Caroline, then Lloyd, then Peter. Lovely, thank you, Louise, and thank you guys for that, for that question. I think it's absolutely critical, particularly in, in, in schools, that we reduce the amount of packages. You know, I, I have two children in year nine at, at Cardin and Newman, and I kind of know exactly what they're what they're buying and what they're not buying and what sort of packaging what they're buying is actually. But we have, and again, as a governor at Newman, when we tendered and retendered uh, the caterers contract, uh, you know, that was one of the key things that we asked for. And actually that caterer has been doing a, a, a very good job. I think to such, such an extent, the care can now have been offered a, a similar contract in another school elsewhere in the city. But packaging itself, again, it's, it, it's got its own trade-offs. And I'll and I tell you why I say that. So things like cucumbers, for example, you know, they're wrapped in a small amount of plastic. And the reason for that is that it keeps them fresh for 14 days. Without that, 
they don't only keep for three days, which means we get more, more waste. And there are some things that we don't really think about that are packaged in such a way for a particular reason. So your, your, your toothpaste, for example, it's packaged with plastic and, uh, and aluminum so that you can actually squeeze toothpaste out of it. And actually we are on the hunt for technology and innovation to make sure that we have materials alternative to that that would allow you to squeeze toothpaste out of, out of that tube. Because again, that innovation is critical. Thank you, Louise. Thanks. Caroline? Thanks so much. <clears throat> and thank you for the question and for the leadership that you're already showing in, in your school. Um, I mean, I think you're absolutely right in the question to focus not just on recycling the packaging that we do end up with, but reducing it at source. And that's why a long-standing Green Party policy is about having a packaging tax to make sure that uh, producers are disincentivized from packing things in so many layers in the first place that we then have to all try and work out what we're going to do with all of the packaging that we're left with. Um, I have long campaigned to eliminate, in particular, the use of, of single-use plastics. I'm a member of the Environmental Audit Select Committee in Parliament. We've done a, a number of inquiries, actually, into this issue. And in particular, we're pressing the government to bring forward the drinks deposit return scheme, which is basically, as you'll know, a way of when you've used your <coughs> bottle for drink or whatever, that you can then uh, take it back uh, and get a small amount of money back for that. Um, many other countries are doing this. Uh, they're well ahead of us. And it's about time our government put in place that kind of deposit return scheme as well. Because the truth is there are some 8 billion drinks campaign, uh, campaign, uh, containers thrown away across the UK every year, which is enough uh, plastic to circle the world five times. So government needs to be doing much more. And I want to just give a shout out for some brilliant examples locally like Hisby or like <clears throat> Infinity Foods and so forth who are uh, properly uh, getting rid of uh, single-use plastic. It can be done. The incentive just needs to work in the right way. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, Lloyd? Um, well, I was very proud to be at Keir Starmer's Shadow um, Environment and Waste Minister for a, a brief period. And one of the areas that we worked on there was about proper uh, pricing for packaging. And the reality is, at the moment, you package something and you the, the producer doesn't really pay the cost of that to the environment or the cost of that to um, and so um, and so what we need is for that to be properly accounted for and then people will start to change and then companies will start to develop new packaging cucumbers for example Samir has mentioned trying to kind of forgive cucumber packaging is totally unnecessary you can use cellophane which is um, 100% um, uh, natural it uses some chemicals but it is fully biodegradable you can use even new fully biodegradable uh, um, packaging on that that doesn't uh, that can be composted so it's not just kind of biodegradable pretend biodegradable but compostable uh, packaging on those it is possible but producers do not move over because at the moment it is cheaper and easier for them not to until we change the pricing regimes and that is the basis of it um, and so rather than trying to apologize for toothpaste producers mm -hmm. what we need to do is say to toothpaste producers if you want to continue to use your unrecyclable toothpaste what we will do is we will tax you for that and suddenly you will see them all changing um, overnight and it will cost the consumer off, almost sorry. nothing that's the difference that we can make um, and in the eu they have done it in here we are still so far <laughs> behind Thank you. Um, just a reminder, uh, keep it to a minute. Um, uh, <laughs> to Peter. Well done, Louise. Now, now you're understanding the realities of dealing with politicians. Um, so uh, I can do this quickly because I agree very fulsomely with, with much of what Caroline said. Uh, the, what, what, what is unknown in the, with the oil companies, the oil producing companies, is that they're doing a lot of advertising about their push towards renewables uh, because actually that's what they need to do for the long-term viability of their business. But what they're doing right now is, is shifting towards plastics and a lot of them are, are producing a huge amount of plastics and increasingly their profits are coming from plastic production, not oil production. So we need to be very mindful about uh, plastic production at source. Uh, I also agree very much with Caroline's words about the plastic bottle deposit scheme. Um, I visited uh, places around the world, like Munich, for example, where they, they have the plastic bottle uh, deposit scheme. It is so simple. It is so easy to use. And everybody uses it. Uh, and it's, it's, just, it's just a great system. Uh, I'm pleased that it was in the last Labour manifesto. Uh, and you can uh, count on me to push for it to be included in the next Labour manifesto, because these are the simple steps forward 
that drive behaviour change that we need to see. Thank you. Thank you all for your answers. And now I'd like to hand over to Brighton College to ask their question and also provide a short update. Hi, right. so, Athena, would you like to talk about the school first? Yeah, in the past few months, Brighton College has introduced living walls composed of different plants selected from plant nurseries in Brighton and Hove. Nothing from our school goes to the landfill, and we are currently expanding our partnerships with different private schemes to increase the number of items we can recycle, for example, crisp packets. We also have an upcycling competition to encourage waste reduction. So our question today is that despite the challenges of the current situation and the recycling contract with Veolia, um, I believe improving the recycling provision is in fact the job of the council and the job of the government. So how will you as a councillor and MP work together with council officers to introduce food waste collections with residents to improve recycling participation and collaboratively raise funds to implement a better recycling system in Brighton, Sussex and beyond. Thank you for your question. And I'd like to ask Caroline to answer first, then Lloyd, then Peter and then Samir. Thanks very much for the question and for all that you're doing. Absolutely agree that a food re uh, collection is, is, is critical in this city uh, and it's, it's embarrassing that we still don't have it and we need to get the finances and I've been lobbying for the finances uh, and that should happen. I'm proud that Greens and Labour have worked together in the council um, and adopted a policy on single-use plastic. Um, and now they are having a much stronger role in encouraging partner organisations and local businesses, for example, to use uh, to, to ditch uh, single-use plastic uh, as well. And, and when the festivals and things like that come into the city to make sure they're not using um, single-use plastic and making sure that as far as possible, those festivals are using a kind of circular economy approach so we don't have more and more waste. I do want to touch just briefly on that Veolia contract though, because it is critical, because it drives me so angry, so mad that we can't recycle pots and tubs and so forth in this city. It is a, an absolute stain. And the reason that we can't is because we're locked into this crazy contract with Veolia until 2033. Now I, spoke to Michael Gove when he was the Environment Secretary and asked him to find the funding to enable the council to break that contract. Otherwise, it's going to cost us millions and we don't have millions. We've got a council budget that's been cut in half in the last 10 years. But unless we can find a way to get out of that contract, then we're going to be stuck in this stupid situation where we're not able to do what most people in the city really want to do, which, to re is, which is to recycle those wider plastic issues. So let's make sure the government gives the council a bit more money so we can do it. Thank you for your answer. Um, I believe it's Lloyd. Me, yes, uh, look, uh, uh, Caroline um, it, it is right that we, um, uh, uh, we need to recycle plastics better, but also other goods as well. You know, we, we can't recycle tinfoil in this city, even though you can recycle tin. The process is exactly the same. Uh, and some of it is actually putting Veolia's feet to the fire. When I found out that we couldn't recycle tinfoil, I made Veolia meet a number of times with the Aluminium Association, who said that they could with some very small amounts of funding, uh, get violas to change uh, their systems. That just requires the council to put political pressure. In Lewis District, where um, Greens and Labour are in full coalition, we've broken the Veolia contract and we recycle everything and have a food waste collection scheme. And the Veolia um, incinerator is even in Lewis District and they've left the Veolia contract. So it is possible with the political will, but it does cost money as well. And I believe that we, uh, we can do it um, uh, and we need to improve also the access and information around recycling, because I'm afraid people in this city just don't know what they can and can't recycle. And it leads to huge amounts um, of recycling that would have been good, just ending up going to waste. And that is also a real problem. We've got one of the worst recycling rates in the country. We need to do better because it is at the moment embarrassing. Thank you so much for your answer. And Peter? Thanks. Uh, I think we just need to change tactic uh, on this because we've all all parties and all of us here have been trying to to get progress on this i mean it is completely crazy that we have food recycled in our offices in parliament but we can't do it from our homes here in brighton and hove 
uh, it just shows the lunacy of it. And so I'm not going to repeat anything the other two have said, because I agree. Uh, I do think that perhaps it's time that the three of us perhaps come together with uh, council representatives and see what, what we can do as a group in terms of bringing pressure both on Veolia and on government. There is precedent for this kind of thing because the challenge that we've got is that the circumstances have changed since the contract was signed. You know, we, the government have signed a pledge for net zero carbon for the entire country. The council has signed a similar pledge for the city. Uh, so the circumstances have changed. And, and as such, and because of the emergency nature of it, you know, you do think that there should be some legislative pressure that could be brought to bear on contracts that are mitigating against our ability to meet climate change targets. They've just done the same, incidentally, in the wake of Grenfell on cladding. So where, where companies have installed cladding and they're, they're locked into it with contracts, uh, there is now pressure being brought to bear that might well change the nature and, uh, of contracts relating to that. Well, I think a similar principle should be applied here. I, I certainly think we should, we should have a conversation between the three of us. Thank you so much, Peter. And Samir? Lovely. Thank, thank you for that. Look, there are issues with, with the Veolia contract. There's, there's no doubt about that. But again, Veolia is a global company. And if you look at what Veolia does in Bristol, in Oxford, in, in Paris, and I've, uh, you know, and I've worked with Veolia supporting cities, they can innovate if they are pushed and if they are asked to innovate. So we've got to go back and ask, what sort of contract did we sign and why? But on, on recycling, you think waste collection, you know, and I'm more than happy to offer any of the schools a visit to the Veolia tip in Hove to have a look at what Veolia does as a separate matter. Our recycling rates are poor. We throw jars into recycling without rinsing them, which means once they get to their end point, they cannot be recycled because the communication and the messaging that reaches the residents of the city from the council doesn't emphasize the point that glass needs to be clean and rinsed. Paper. If you mix A4 sheets of paper with shredded paper, you cannot recycle that because there are two different processes. An A4 sheet of paper has long fibers which can be recycled, shredded paper does not. So when you mix the two together, you immediately cannot recycle that. So the messaging around that has to be clear. You know, we have systems in place that should enable us to have a high recycling rate, but we do not as a city. And I think we should come clean and actually say, look, let's start with the messaging Let's then look at our systems and actually work together, I agree with colleagues, because that's the only way we can move this forward. Thank you all for your answers. And so we'll move on to Blatchington Nil's question um, with a short update um, with what the school's done over the last whole month. Thanks so much. Um, so we're continuing to see the benefits here at Blatchington Mill of a number of sustainable initiatives we've put in in the past, such as solar panels on our roofing um, and thinking about using more reduced and sustainable options in our canteen. Uh, over the last 12 months, there's been a lot of push on whole school climate education, including assemblies on COP26 and Earth Day, which was last week. We've also recently undertaken a community week of action where we've done things such as litter picks on site and in the community community and our senior student team has also now branched out into a more sustainability based role so we have a team of students in our year 11s who are committed to improving sustainability within the school. Uh, so my question is, is why at COP26 did we not make punishments if we don't meet our climate goals? Uh, and so for this question we'll have Lloyd first, then Peter, then Samir and then Caroline. Well, why the Globe didn't make uh, punishments uh, for not meeting the goals is because the agreements, unfortunately, require consensus. Um, and even those who in the past have refused to join COP properly are part of the table that have to agree that consensus. So that is one of the reasons that a global level it wasn't achieved. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be putting in um, punishments if we don't achieve it nationally. We could be pushing our government to do that. Now, the Labour government was the first government in the world to introduce the Climate Change Act, which does put legal responsibilities on the Secretary of State. But now we know it's too late, um, and it's too limited, uh, because, of course, by the time we know the damage will be done, that Secretary of State will be long gone. So we do need to update now the legal, and I would even argue some criminal responsibility to people who are taking part in undermining 
our goals, and that should extend to uh, um, to companies. That will suddenly change the whole narrative. If people feel like they are legally responsible for damaging this planet, then maybe they will prevent and stop the damage that their company's actions and individual actions I'm are doing. I'm going to cut you off there. Thank you. Oh, all done. Uh, Peter. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Uh, the, the, the phenomenal thing about the COP summits is the diplomatic challenges that it that it, it is posed by it. The really big. I mean, we didn't know, for example, until the day of it whether China would would arrive or not. We didn't know that some other countries were going to arrive or not. Actually, right up to the moment of it. Now that was a failure of negotiation by Boris Johnson in the lead up to it. But it does show just how difficult the diplomatic challenge is. And the key thing is getting people around the table. If you add another barrier to that, then I, I fear that we will lose some countries getting around the table in the first place. But we do have to have the, the, the real you know, goal here is having legally binding targets. You know, we, we've had some in the past. We didn't get enough of them in COP26. Uh, and there's not enough talk about them in the lead up to COP27. But legally binding targets also, when you say punishment, you know, it would be great if you as students could think about what punishment you think would be appropriate and that countries could conceivably sign up to? And who would be the body that actually enforces those punishments? Because you can't send an entire country to prison. Uh, it is unlikely that you can send a Secretary of State, as, as, as Lloyd says, who is constantly changing. So what kind of punishments would make the difference that would still incentivize countries who are really struggling to make these changes, because they're not as rich as Britain is, to actually come around the table? These are really challenging times um, and then the really key thing is getting people around the table and getting them to commit to binding targets. So Samir, please thank you. Lovely, thank you for that and thank you for the question. Look, it's um, th there were good outcomes from, from COP26. You know, we had the Climate Pact, we had the Paris Rule Book and so on, and we had some really good commitments. So end deforestation by 2030, half emissions by mid-decade to limit temperature rise to, to 1.5 degrees. What happens next is critical. And what happens kind of when you use a combination of a carrot and, and, and the stick? And these are the actions. And these are actions on countries. These are actions on towns. These are actions on cities. These are actions on, on communities. On, on governments, they have to fix these targets in law because that's how you make a start. And I think that's the internal bit. In terms of punishment, it, international gatherings and treaties like like COP, don't threaten punishment. They don't threaten penalties, for example, you know, but they rely on a combination of diplomacy, practical strategies, pressure tactics, you know, to ensure cooperation and so on. And that's why possibly I think I'm, I'm kind of making a supposition, COP was given to Egypt and the UAE to kind of to help, you know, those kind of most emitting countries of the Middle East to kind of get, get along to the table and kind of do their bit. But that's the sort of diplomacy that happens in the background. And, you know, there's an emerging field. I'm going to have to cut you off. Field. Field. Climate diplomacy. Sorry. Get into that. Sorry. Thank uh, you, Louise. Caroline, please. Thank you. And thanks for the question. Well, COP26 left the aspiration to uh, keep temperatures below 1.5 hanging by a thread. That's what our own government has admitted. So uh, it was not sadly a great success. Um, and we do need to do a lot more. And certainly the developed countries and, 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 and a country like the UK that is disproportionately responsible for climate emissions needs to be doing a whole lot more. I think that there should be penalties at a national level. I take the point that imposing that globally is more difficult, but certainly there should be penalties facing a government who is not delivering the policies that are there to meet the targets that have already been set in law under the Climate Change Act. For that reason, I'm very pleased that Friends of the Earth right now is taking out a court case against our government because it is not going to meet its targets in the 2008 Climate Change Act. It set out a, a net zero strategy earlier in this year. And if you add up all of the different emission reductions that are planned in there, it's not going to make the grade. So uh, it shouldn't have to fall to um, non-government organizations to take uh, the government to court. There should be something that is stronger than that. But in the in the absence of that, I hope that court case will be successful. And I do agree with Lloyd that having some kind of law for corporations that continue to pollute and wreck the earth with impunity is important. And that's why I support something called the law of ecocide at the UN as well. Thank you. Very short answers. Um, 
finally, we will hand over to Vanding College to answer the, uh, to ask their question, and if they'd like to provide a short update, that would be appreciated. So, uh, Thank Vanding you so College. Much. I'm representing the Student-Led Climate and Environmental Action Group of Vanding College, and since this group was quite recently founded in the beginning of this school year, so in September 2021, we've had three main focuses. And those are to make our canteen more sustainable by increasing the amount of locally sourced products and decreasing the amount of plastic. Then we're planning to further develop our eco gardens. And lastly, we're planning to make use of the frequent rain in England by making rainwater harvesting to use for watering those eco gardens and potentially to use for rainwater flush as well. And furthermore, we've also been doing the carbon literacy education program. And our question is, are you aware of the issues surrounding lack of support for students to implement green initiatives at their institution? Many students put great amounts of hard work into ideas and plans for their school or college to take climate change and biodiversity action, but resources to support these initiatives are often limited. We're students met by adults saying that resources, time and budget doesn't allow it. What are you aiming to do to change this and support young students to make the necessary sustainable changes at their institution? Thank you so much for your question. And um, uh, could Peter uh, answer first, then Samir, then Caroline, and then Louis finally. Thanks. Well, I make this commitment to any students who are residents of Hove or go to schools that are based in Hove, and that's that I'll work with you to try and find funding on any of these schemes that you come up with. You know, me and my office here, we have a, a really good kind of knowledge of all of the funds and the schemes and the, and the grants that are available out there to support this kind of work. So if you do have an idea, then get in touch with me and I'll certainly work with you. But don't be put off by it because the challenges that you're facing in terms of getting funding and coming up with great ideas that you sometimes can't implement are things that you come across right the way through your life. And certainly if you go into advocacy and politics, whether it's local for the council or whether it's up there in parliament, you, know, you will come up across these barriers throughout your life. So don't be put off uh, and dissuaded by, and, and disheartened by your school for not always having the resources to help you. They'll want to do so too. But find the people who can help you overcome them. And sometimes it will be outside of the school that the solution lies. Working together with like-minded people from different organizations, from different walks of life, really helps unlock things. So certainly see me as a partner and I make that commitment to you. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. And um, moving on to Samir. Uh, lovely, thank you, Ben. Can you hear me? I've lost my, yeah, I am unmuted. No, that's fine, so I'm just checking. Uh, look, I think like, like Peter, and, and, and thank you for the question. I think we are your champions, you know, so use us, use all of us and all our connections and contacts and, and, and knowledge, you know, absolutely. Um, that's why, for example, I was um, at, at Basvik earlier in the week doing a sustainability masterclass. You think that's, that's critical, you know, for you, but also for your teachers and, and the people who support the teachers and your facilities and your estates teams and your governors, you know, because these are, these are again, the people you're always kind of lobbying to, lobbying for, for funding to help take your, take, you know, the funding, whether it's eco gardens or rainwater flush, but actually, you know, when you look at your, your, your school estate, and I'm sure your, your school managers and business managers will be, will be struggling with this because we have a very, well, we have in some cases, and I think Bardeen is, is one of them as with the other schools, you know, we have some older buildings that don't necessarily perform at the level of energy efficiency. And Sorry, Samir, I'm going to have to. We want them to. So it's, it's, it's a bigger task, I think, but you know, we're here for you. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. And Caroline, please. Thanks so much. Thanks for the question. And yes, there could well be some small scale funds out there, you know, maybe via the council that has some grants, but even also actually around some local businesses might be able to help. And so similarly in Brighton Pavilion, if there are schools that want to uh, be in touch to see how we might be able to do that, I'd be happy to do it. But I think money is part of the issue. The other part is is time and how much time there is in the uh, in the school day now to to be able to pursue some of these initiatives which are so important um, I think there's a big question there actually about just how narrow the national curriculum is and personally I think schools should have more more flexibilities and, and, and freedoms I think nature and climate should be mainstream throughout 
every subject that you're uh, taking at schools. Um, in addition to that, I've been championing the idea of a new GCSE in natural history. And I'm really delighted that um, just last week, the government has um, announced that that new qualification will come uh, in 2025, I think. So too late for most of you, but um, I, I think it's important to have spaces in the curriculum where, where this can be pursued uh, in, in the kind of classes that you're doing as well as in the culture of the school more widely. And if we can bring those two together, then we've got the best chance of making success. Thank you so much for your answer, Caroline. And uh, finally, I'd like to pass over to Lloyd. Uh, Caroline uh, and Peter are quite right that, uh, that as MPs, we, we're always willing to help you if there are small pots of money that, that can be found. Um, and, and sometimes that can be the case. But the reality is that we have seen huge cuts in school funding, um, you know, places like Vardine and Baswick have to pay VAT on all their products, whilst other schools here don't. So it's not even a level playing field between schools. You know, kind of Brighton College doesn't pay VAT, Vardine does. That's not that's not fair. And so it does also mean that some schools are more able to put money into things where others aren't. So there's inequality there in the system. And what we do need to do is a restoration of some of the schools building programmes that we saw under last Labour government, which actually did transform the school estate and make it more green as well. And that's not about just knocking down schools. That's about rebuilding them, uh, re, uh, re-insulating them and getting the school community on board. And then finally, it's about making sure your teachers aren't overworked, are they? Because at the moment, they're overstretched and overworked because we've not put enough money and resources into getting um, uh, staff in schools and in colleges. And that also needs a change uh, from the government because uh, reducing the amount of paperwork and tick boxing exercises uh, that, 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 that people do. I want to see the end or the reform of some of the testing processes so teachers can focus on actually teaching and supporting you and your projects. Thank you everyone uh, for their questions and also to our speakers for answering all of them brilliantly. Um, that does conclude our question portion of today's Q&A. Unfortunately, we, uh, we overran, so there is no time for a breakout room, but um, we think it's really important that students will students can have an opportunity to provide feedback to the speakers so if there are any students here who would like to give a brief feedback on today's event we'd really appreciate hearing that someone okay, yeah oh, so, go for it. hi i'm lance lau um from bryson college i'd just like to ask how exactly would you like how exactly could we get you to get together with the council what things what actions should be taken to kind of you know actually get this whole recycling deal um how do we get people to actually sit down and talk about it well we yeah. do oh uh <laughs> peter i think you had your hand up first sorry but then caroline please do follow follow I, I suspect caroline and i are going to say the same thing caroline you go Oh, bless you. <laughs> well, I was going to say that, that the three MPs, at least, and less so MPs plus council, but there's no reason why that couldn't happen. But the MPs do work together for the interests of the city. And um, I, I don't think you would need to work very hard to make sure that uh, Peter and myself and Lloyd uh, do get together to talk about the Veolia contract. And obviously, because it affects the council, I'm sure Samir or, or, or anyone else from the council, Felim, would be very welcome to take part in that as well. Um, it's something that I know has been on all of our minds for a very long time. Each of us have been trying individually to, to solve it. Uh, maybe if we get all three or four heads together, we will be able to, to, to get there. I'm really interested to learn how Lewis did it. I don't know that. And I'm going to go away and find out. Just to say, we, we're, very, we're very respectful about the, the role of the council. We don't, we don't tell the council what to do. Uh, and we have a very different set of responsibilities as MPs than councillors do and the council collectively. So, you know, we would see our, our role as being a partner to council to try and solve this problem. So we wouldn't just go away and just do something and then present a solution to them. What we would do is, uh, is work alongside them and, and involve them. But as parliamentarians, uh, particularly when you work cross party, you do have, uh, you do have a, a kind of legitimacy that's something that is different to the, to the council. So if we can use that platform to try and knock some heads together, um, then, then of course, you know, we'll do it. So, after this, you know, but how it works is my office, because one of us has got to coordinate, my office will be in touch with the other two and we find a time that we'll get together, probably up in, up in London, where we'll have a conversation about this, uh, how we move forward, uh, and we'll invite Veolia in uh, and, and take it from there. But we'll let you all know uh, the progress. 
so, so sorry um, that we can't answer any questions, unfortunately, to timing constraints. But um, in totality, I would like to thank everybody for coming and special thank you to uh, the MPs uh, and councilmen uh, who have answered um, our questions. Uh, so thank you all for coming. <laughs>